All right. Continuing our study through the exciting tale, the exciting story, historical narrative of Ruth. And remember that we just finished Judges, where we learned of terrible things taking place, um, things that it's hard to imagine they're in the Bible, but they're there. And uh, I think that's why Ruth, part of the reason why the book of Ruth is so refreshing is understanding how, just how intense the environment got, was at the time that this story takes place. There were just people, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. So there were, then there was no king. So there was no moral standard. Um, and it's a lot like the days that we live in, where the Bible is just kind of done away with. What would that book have to tell me today? I have my own conscience can tell me what's right and what's wrong. And that's straight from hell. <laughs> we need the Word of God. Without it, we are lost. Without it, anything goes without that. It's actually kind of a fun debate to get into. If somebody doesn't believe in God, what's wrong with stealing? What's wrong with lying? If there is no God, it's only by your standard. It's only because you see it as wrong or whatever. And that's the way it was during the time of the judges. It's pretty uh, amazing. But remember, Ruth found grace in the eyes of this man, Boaz. And we talked about, a lot about Boaz. One thing I failed to mention last week, it was in my notes, but I don't always read everything in my notes. Um, in, um, I believe it was Second Kings, there's a story of Solomon building his temple. First Kings, I'm sorry, First Kings 7.21. Solomon builds his temple in 1 Kings 7.21. He names one of the strong pillars. There's two big columns, like big pillars that hold up the whole temple. One of the names of those pillars is Boaz. And I think it's important to note this was a strong pillar of his time. Um, and so there's a reason. It's, everything in the Bible is for a reason. And that's one thing. Boaz, his name, we, we said, means strength or standing in strength. And so uh, it's a perfect name for a pillar. That's what Solomon later on, when he builds the temple, he names one of those pillars uh, Boaz. And it's a, it's a great uh, reminder for us who this Boaz is, what he's a type of. But here... Uh, well, the, it ends with Naomi giving thanks in chapter 2. Maybe we'll just begin at verse 20 of chapter 2 in typical Calvary Chapel fashion. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not left of him off his kinsmen to the living or the, and to the dead. And Naomi said to Ruth, the man is near of kin unto us. He's our, one of our next kinsmen. And verse 21 of Ruth chapter 2. Ruth the Moabite said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast or stay close by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter-in-law, that thou go out with his hand, maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she did. She stayed close by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Then her mother-in-law, Naomi, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? that it may be well with thee. Verse 2 of chapter 3. Now is not Boaz of our kindred, 
with whose maidens thou was? Behold, he winnows the barley, barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint, thy, anoint thee, and put thine raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. Good advice for any woman. Don't talk to him, don't bother the man until he's done eating. Not, well, not one chuckle, okay. Verse 4. And it shall be when he lies down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie down, and thou shalt go in and shall and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. So she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Verse 6, And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Verse 7, And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry, and he went to lie down at the, at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Now Boaz, it came to pass at midnight that the man Boaz was afraid and he turned himself, and behold, there's a woman laying at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over me, or over thine handmaiden, for thou art near a near kinsman. Verse 10, And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. Inasmuch as thou followed not young men, whether poor or rich. Verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do thee all that thou require, for all the city of my people does know, and here's a huge compliment, Ruth, thou art a virtuous woman. Now, if this was a movie, you'd want it to end there. You would want it to be like, the, the perfect love story. Okay, he's going to take on this responsibility, but now I mentioned last week there's a wrench in the system, a problem. Uh-oh. Verse 12, And now it is true that I am the near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. There's someone closer to your family than I am. Tarry this night Stay here tonight, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, that is, marry you, um, perform unto thee the part of the kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of, the kins of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord lives, Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning. And she rose up before one could know another or recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor, into the threshing floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it out, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, uh, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done unto her. Verse 17, And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto your mother-in-law. Then she said, still, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he has finished the, the, the thing this day. So, here you have Ruth and this interesting glimpse into the culture, the time, what, what took place at this time. And there's many things in this chapter that get kind of, uh, well, misunderstood. Um, 
But something that I think we need to understand is that this was a duty, this was a law, that if a man was to die, like Ruth's husband died, and even more so like Naomi's husband died at the beginning of our story, there was this law of redemption, this law of uh, the nearest of kin or the kinsman redeemer who would take really responsibility for his dead relative. Most of the time it was his brother. So that's what's being referred to as the next of kin, the duty of the kinsman, as Boaz is having this conversation. But a few things right off the bat. Notice that Ruth listened to her mother-in-law. She didn't have to, but she did. She took the advice of her mother-in-law. Now, her mother-in-law is telling her to go in to this place, the threshing floor, which we'll talk a little more about, but a place where they were to work winnowing the wheat and really just making sure that all of the harvest, all of the um, everything coming in from the crops was kept. Remember, why was Boaz, a wealthy man, spending the night out in the threshing floor with all of the wheat? Remember, this is at the time when everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. You had not only Moabites, you had Ammonites, you had Philistines that were looking for places where hard-earned grain harvest was brought in and they could rip it all off. And it happened quite a bit at that time. We don't know anything about that here in San Francisco. No, yeah, the same thing was going on. And so that's one reason Boaz is actually out at night. He's protection. He's being there out of being a good master, a good owner. He doesn't have someone else doing it for him. He's out there himself. And so that's one reason why, um, and Naomi knew, she, she had apparently gotten wind that he would be there and protecting over and even staying the night there. So he tells Ruth, hey, get yourself all dolled up, go in there, and you propose to Boaz. Now this is not at all what we think of as proposals. The woman shouldn't be proposing. Right. Unless it's this whole issue of the kinsman redeemer. As I mentioned, there was a law that if a husband died without offspring, without kids of his own, that the widowed wife was now entitled. It was actually her right. It was the widowed wife, in this case, Naomi or Ruth. They're both widows. But it was their right to go and request of his next of kinsmen that, that he might take her to wife and raise up children instead of in, in the place of the, the uh, dead husband so that his name could go on, if you will. So this was a very common law. However, he did not have to do it. And this is where it gets kind of strange. There was a strange law, and we'll get into this next week, Lord willing, in chapter 4, where if the man refused, so let's say Ruth came to Boaz and said, you're the next of kin, and he refused to do so, he could do that, but he had to take one of his shoes off. Are you guys listening? Thank you. He took off one of his shoes, and he handed it to her. She then, in typical fashion, would spit in his face, but I hope I have your contention now, this really was part of all of this. If the man refused to marry her and take the role of responsibility in keeping the name of his dead brother or his dead relative, the name alive, he could refuse it. But he gave her his shoe. She spit in his face. He would then 
be kind of shamed in his community because it was publicly known. He'd be walking around with one foot barefoot and spit, you know, dribbling off of him and everyone knew that stood for something. He was making that claim that it was proposed to me, it was brought to my attention that one of my relatives died, but guys, if you saw the girl, you would have said no to. And so the whole community then would he, they would look down on him and he would be shamed in that way because this was the honorable, the proper thing to do in Israel. This was just what you did. However, you didn't have to. You could take that route and go shoeless. <laughs> and so, interesting, but this was just something that that was taking place, so I think it's important that we understand that. She was wanting, Naomi was wanting Ruth to make sure this proposal, this appeal, if you will, was put out there. That Boaz would know, you are the kinsman redeemer, you are the Goel, the guy that is close, and Boaz seems to be alone in knowing, well, there's actually a closer one. And so this other guy, if you're doing a movie, you always portray, you know, Boaz as this, you know, I don't know, the, the handsome guys of today, you know, Chris Hemingsworth, I don't know who you, who you guys put out there as these strapping young guys. And then you put this close relative that she's got to go and see, maybe he's going to say yes. You play him as like the Danny DeVito guy or someone, you know. Oh boy, he's a closer relative. He's got a chance here, an opportunity, and he might say yes. So it's, the plot kind of thickens here. There's a twist, isn't there? Because Boaz says, and, and it's interesting too that Boaz doesn't just take the opportunity. Um, one of the things that should be noted is the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3 there, you learn that there's some time there is some time that Ruth now is getting to know Boaz. Not only Ruth, but Naomi, through word of mouth, every day Ruth is going out and taking the grain, uh, gleaning the fields. Boaz told her, stay close to all of my people. Don't go into other fields. That was time given because the barley harvest had not yet come. So there's time that's, there's this span of time, and I think it's important. Ruth and Boaz did not date in the way that we view dating in our day. I think it's important to point that out. Because the way that we raise our kids in dating in our day, the way that we review, we view it, is very damaging. And what I mean by that is most of dating today will teach kids, will teach people how to break up well, more than last in a long-lasting marriage or relationship. What Ruth and Boaz were doing was getting to know each other in a group setting with many other people around, in a public setting. Not, you know, running off here and there like the movies portray it. Not, you know, a lot of alone time. No, this in fact seems to be the first time. That's why Boaz is so stirred. He's so like caught off guard. Not only that, Boaz, in his mind, he's like, she wants someone her own age. He's a lot older. That's why he calls her daughter a lot. My daughter. And he even says, doesn't he? I figured you'd be for the younger men. There's a lot of younger men around. He didn't see himself as really worthy. So it's interesting, and there's so much in here you can take and glean from just that. Getting to know who you're going to be with for the rest of your life in a group setting. And even more so, they were at work. She was working. I don't know if my wife would end up with me if she was at work with me every day. Before. You know. 
seeing me in the work field. Am I alone in that? Okay, I'll be alone in that. We get mad at work. We, get, we lose our patience at work. We blow off steam at work. Boaz, she got to know him. And even more so, Naomi heard about how good this man was. How kind this man was. She went so far as to see him as safe, didn't she? Go into this man at night, into the threshing floor. A midnight rendezvous. No, that's not what's happening here. You can read it and think, Naomi is putting Ruth out there as a gold digger, a trap for this man. No, that's not it at all. As I mentioned, this is very proper. This is a basically a proposal or an appeal, if you will. She's putting herself at the mercy, really, of Boaz. She's already kind of done this, but it was Boaz before her who brought her and said, stay close to my field and my people and all of that. But now it's Ruth coming and laying at his feet. And there's a lot just in this. For one thing, in uh, verse 6, the, I think it's verse 6, the threshing floor. No? Yeah, she went down to the, th the threshing floor and did all that her mother told her. The threshing floor should be marked because it was at the threshing floor where, remember just a few months back, maybe a year or so, in Judges chapter 6, in Judges chapter 6, there was another that was at the threshing floor. He was terrified for his life in Judges chapter 6. Chapter 6, Gideon was there at the threshing floor, hiding from the Midianites. And it was there at the threshing floor God called Gideon. It became a special place, didn't it? It's also in 2 Samuel 24, 24, easy one from memory. It's David who later on purchases a threshing floor, basically to sacrifice to the Lord the first fruits of everything. And he says, because the person loved David, King David, so much, he said, I'll just give you this threshing floor. It's yours. You can have it. And what did David say in 2 Samuel 24, 24? It's one that should be marked and underlined. I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. It should be in all of our hearts. It should be written on all of our hearts. In other words, I don't just give to the Lord the leftovers. I don't just give to the Lord that which, you know, if you find this, sadly, people donate junk to the church. We're not using this anymore. Maybe God can use it. And, and that's not the idea. David says, no, I'm not going to give to the Lord. And so the threshing floor always in the Bible is this place of sacrifice, of sanctity, being set apart. And that's where Boaz and Ruth are in our story. The first time where they're really, she's really letting him know this is more than just a friendship in our story. And I love this in verse 7 where um, oh, this is where the connection is. I'm sorry, I almost messed up, missed all of that. So the threshing floor. See, in the field, when Ruth was in the field in chapter 2, she was in the field, what? Gleaning for herself. So Ruth was in the field gleaning for herself. Here she comes in chapter 3, 
to the flat threshing floor and she's giving of herself. The field is basically the place where you and I can glean and it's the field of Jesus. Boaz is our kinsman redeemer. But too many are still in the field gleaning, taking in all that they can for themselves. When you get to a place of maturity, you come into what's called the threshing floor. You begin to give of yourself. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, offer your bodies a living sacrifice to the Lord. It's a place of maturity. It's a place of growth where you're not just sitting, taking in, taking in, taking in. It's called being a constipated Christian. Just keep there, taking it all in, taking it all in. You've got to get to the threshing floor, the place where things are thrown up in the air and the heaviness falls down. And all of the, well, the wheat and the chaff are separated there in the threshing floor. It's a lot that could be said about the threshing floor, but the main thing is it's giving of yourself. It's sacrifice. And that's what Ruth is finding here. So there's a beautiful picture there from the field to the threshing floor here. But notice verse 7. She comes and when Boaz had eaten, his heart was merry, he went to lie down. She came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. There's this sculpture that was sculpted by this, this uh, fellow, Thor's Walden. And he chill, chiseled this incredible statue of Jesus Christ, Thor's Walden. But because of the position that Jesus is in, in this big statue of Jesus Christ, you can't see his face. And everyone's, you know... <laughs> Wondering why you know you make this incredible sculpture, this incredible statue of Jesus, and there's a sign posted next to this statue of Jesus that says, "If you desire to see His face, you must first sit at His feet." And as you sit at the feet of Jesus, at this statue that this guy made, you can look up and make out his face. And it's only as you sit at his feet. In the same way, it's like that for you, for me, for Ruth, here in our story. She's at the feet of Boaz. Who is Boaz? He's a type, isn't he? He's a picture of Jesus Christ. He's strong. He's secure. Naomi knows that. He's kind. He's generous. All of the connections that, that you want to make, you could make. But coming to the feet of Jesus and sitting at the feet of Jesus, that's where we find security. Above all, peace that passes understanding. We really will not see His face unless we first sit at His feet. It's true. Praise God, we will see His face. But there's those who, who just aren't patient enough. They've got their own stuff to go get to. You can't sit at the feet of Jesus all day. Listen, Mary chose the better as Jesus looked at Martha and said, Mary has chosen the better. Come, all ye who are weary, you're heavy laden. There's a big load on your back. There's a lot that you're carrying. Come and lay it down at his feet. And you'll find peace. You'll find rest. Everything that you've been looking for is there at the feet of Jesus. In the same way, Ruth will find redemption for not only her, but her mother-in-law and the family. Naomi. And of course, the, 
the funny scene where, where Boaz kind of wakes up, he's startled, like I said, who is that? Remember, it's dark, it's midnight. And Ruth sneaks in, gently covers, un uncovers his feet, and sit, lays there at his feet. Another thing that should be said about that is, this another thing that's cultural that we don't understand about this, is that was a typical place for a servant to come and lay at his master's feet, at the bed of his master, at the feet, waiting for any command. If someone was coming to steal the grain, to steal the income, you're, you would have a servant there that you could that would be ready with a weapon or ready with something to take care of, of whatever the master's needs were. So she's in a place of submission, and she's Boaz is now her master. She's saying that just by coming and laying at his feet. It's not a a sexual thing at all. See, that's in another part with our Americanized uh, <laughs> minds and brains and books and movies, all that stuff. It messes this whole thing up because this is really a, a uh, beautiful picture here. There's much more there. But he says, oh, in verse 9 is key that's where we get the title of our message, actually, is from verse 9. He says to her, "Where, uh, who are you? And she says, it's Ruth, your handmaid. And she says this phrase that, again, is misinterpreted. It's misunderstood by many. Ruth says to Boaz, spread therefore thy skirt over your handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. She tells him there in that moment, you're the guy. You're the relative that's supposed to marry Naomi or me. That's what that whole phrase being nearest of kinsmen. kinsmen. What we don't understand in our culture is the skirt or what many in many places is called the hem of the garment. See, the hem of the garment of any man was his position, his status. What we have is stupid badges on sleeves in the military. Stripes that mean stuff. They had on, this, on the hem of their skirt, on the hem of this garment that they would have, it was basically the authority. That's why when you get to Samuel, you see David, what does he do? He cuts the hem of Saul's garment. And everyone in that room would gasp in horror. <gasps> How in the world did you do that? That's like ripping the badge off of a military officer, you know, the, one of the big high-ranking guys coming along and ripping the badge off of his sleeve. That's what it was like. That's why when you get to the New Testament, you find this woman that's suffering from a blood hemorrhaging. And what does she do? She just knows if she can touch what? The hem of his garment. That's his authority. And she was looking at things physically, but God, by his grace, touched her and healed her physically. Even though all she really had to do was say the word, and Jesus would heal her. So this is not a sexual thing at all, again, to put your skirt over me in that way. No. This was, you cover me. That's why I titled it, Cover Me. Simply, let me be under your roof. Let me be under your authority. Let me take on your name. That's the ultimate thing, what marriage really is. It's becoming one flesh. And again, this was a duty. You can hear it as Boaz responds. And it's amazing that Boaz doesn't get right up and go to Vegas right then with her and just get it done and go and... No, he doesn't do that. He's a lot smarter than most of us today. 
He doesn't rush into it. Obviously, God is with it. God's in it. What are you doing, Boaz? Many of us would say, who cares about this next guy that's closer? It's, it, no, Boaz is a righteous man. He wants to do things right. It could be simple. I mean, it could be real small and seemingly insignificant. But Boaz doesn't cut corners. He's not just running off, eloping, going to the courthouse, doing what, what well, we just know that it's got to take place because the state of California, all that stuff. You know. No, none of that's going on. This is a long, and the, the, what it says about love in the Bible is really true. Love is patient. It doesn't rush into things. It's not always looking to cut corners. Oh, we better do this right. And you can feel Ruth kind of, maybe her heart sinks a little bit. Oh, there's another guy. Oh, great. What does he look like? Is he respectful? All of those things. Well, we'll get the plot thickens. It's a cliffhanger. I'm going to leave you on the edge tonight. But you can always read ahead. Most of you already did. <laughs> but don't miss all of the incredible uh, types that we get in this. Another one that I'll throw out to you that maybe many pass over, many don't think about. Ruth is a type of a Gentile bride. She is a Gentile bride and becomes a type of the church. You and I are called the bride of Christ. The church is not made up of Jews. The church is made up of Gentiles. And so we are the Gentile bride of Christ. That's why and that's this whole story of Ruth and Boaz. Why it's so fascinating, really. But even more so, the, the, it can deepen a little bit. We, we mentioned this a little bit on who introduced Ruth to Boaz? An unnamed servant. Remember that from last week? You get the same thing in Genesis 24 when Isaac is introduced to Rebekah. It's an unnamed servant. We talked about the Holy Spirit being an un... He never speaks of himself. Well, it's true throughout the Bible. He's consistent with that. If Ruth is a type of the church, Boaz is a type of what? Who? Jesus Christ. Yeah, the only answer you need to know. Yeah. Boaz is a type of Jesus. Naomi then becomes a beautiful type, illustration of Israel. The nation of Israel. She's there. <laughs> and she came out from her land. Notice she could not go back to her land until Ruth was ready. When is Israel going to be promised back in their land? When we're ready as the bride of Christ to go be with our hubby, Jesus Christ, Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. You see how this story becomes so much more than just on the surface. It really did happen. It's a historical narrative. It really did take place, but the Holy Spirit has things written in it and even omitted, taken out from it, things that are not there that are significant. Amazing. Like the name of the servant who introduced Boaz to Ruth. It's omitted. It's not there. And the Holy Spirit does those things on purpose. It really is Fascinating how many different connections can be made in just concerning this. And I don't make up this stuff. It's written that the Lord reveals Himself through the prophets and through what are called similitudes. What's a similitude? Well, it's this big bug that, no, I'm just kidding. See it who's still awake. A similitude 
And it's, it's uh, Hosea that I'm referring to. I don't think I wrote it down, though. But Hosea, he, basically the Lord reminds Hosea, I speak through the prophets and through these similitudes that are, are basically, here it is, Hosea 12, 10. If, if I just find it, I'd just read it, it make more sense. Hosea 12, chapter 12, verse 10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. In other words, you will find pictures. That's what similitudes is. It's types, models. That's what we have with Ruth and Boaz. That's what you have earlier in Genesis chapter 22, maybe the most fascinating chapter in all the Bible. A father going up on the mountain to what? Sacrifice his son. Who's the father? Abraham. Who's the son? Isaac. But on that same mountain, same exact location, there's another father that sacrifices his son and allows that son to suffer and die. Whereas with Abraham and Isaac, what happened? A ram showed up, caught in the thicket. God put a stop to it. And he said something incredible in Genesis 22. That's the Lord shall provide himself a lamb. And he himself was the lamb that would be provided. You find out Abraham knew exactly what he was doing because Abraham says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be shown. It shall be seen. And then on that same mount, that was, was seen. You want to know what's even more fascinating? Will blow your mind? There, there's something in the Bible, something when you're studying the Bible that we should always remember that's the law of what? The law of first mention. You want to know the first time love is ever mentioned in the Bible? Genesis chapter 22. There with the story of Abraham, a father, giving his one son, Isaac, the beloved son, the one that they longed for and prayed for for so long, Isaac who loved Abraham, who loved Isaac. First time the word love is ever used in the Bible. It's important. The first time any word, you want to go through it. You didn't know you could do uh, <laughs> so many research. I mean, the Bible is full. We talked about shoes earlier. Guy takes off his shoe and gives it to the, the woman. The woman can spit in her face. You could do a whole study on shoes. Did you know that? What was it that God asked Moses to remove before coming? His shoes. There's things throughout the Bible. What was it that didn't wear out all that time in the wilderness? Forty years, the wilderness wanderings. Their what? Shoes did not wear out. You think things aren't significant? You're not reading your Bible. Every word Everything You can go through this thing and it'll make you, it makes your head explode. Yeah. You can do research. This book is full. It's filled with all wonder. Incredible things we can look into. So I'm not reaching <laughs> when I talked about Ruth and Boaz here and Naomi. There's even this this clown that comes in nearest of kinsmen. I shouldn't call him a clown. And nearest of kinsmen, who could he be a picture of? Well, it's not so much a who, it's what could he be a picture of? I believe it's the law. Because what the law could not do, bring us to Jesus Christ. The law will not bring you to Jesus Christ. Grace does. Boaz is able Moses. Through Moses came what? The law. But grace and truth came from Jesus Christ.
through Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer. So as I mentioned, Naomi, type of Israel. Ruth, a type of the church. Boaz, Jesus Christ, the type of Jesus Christ. And even this, this nearest of kin, this guy that's closer than Boaz maybe, is the law, could be looked at as the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten. All of the law, and the, which everything's perfect. It's, it's as close as you can get. The law shows us who God is. But what the law could not do, we can accomplish by grace. So much here. So things are set in play. She comes back to Naomi, her mother-in-law, Ruth, comes out of that scene. What a beautiful scene. There in the threshing floor, the place of sacrifice, the place where Ruth gives of herself, basically saying, I am yours. You are my master. I'm your servant. And by the way, this was all foreordained. You're related to Naomi. <laughs> to Naomi's husband, husband that's died now. But she gets something from Boaz. He says, let's see the, the shout, the, the little, the veil that you came in with and I'll fill it up. And this isn't, everything in this is significant. Because why is it six measures of meal? Six measures of barley is measured out to her, put into the thing. What's interesting is there's even a clue, because Ruth had no idea. Ruth is a, is a Gentile. She doesn't know about the Jewish customs, what Jews believe and Jews held so dearly to, one of those things being the Sabbath. Why the Sabbath? When was the Sabbath and what even established the Sabbath? Six days the Lord worked. On the seventh, what? He went rested. Look at what Naomi says in the last verse. Then said she, sit still, Ruth, Verse 18, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in what? Rest. Sabbath. He will not rest, Ruth. And how do you know that, Naomi? The six measures of barley would speak of those six days that the Lord worked. There's a connection there. I know it's hard to see. It's a little bit deep. You have to un uncover it with the wording and all that, but basically that's all you need to know. Six days the Lord worked, on the seventh he rested. Know this, he will not rest until this matter be dealt with, until this is all said and done, which Boaz told uh, Ruth earlier, as surely as the Lord lives. That's, that's, you're taking this, this is a promise. If this other guy is going to refuse I'm your man. I'll take it. I'll be there. So everything, everything has a great significance, a great, well, there's great meaning behind all of it, isn't there? It's so deep. And I love it. But the main thing is God has His desire for us to be with Him for all of eternity. And He's done everything so that we actually enter into His, what, rest. See, the Sabbath has nothing to do with a man, or sorry, it has nothing to do with the, the day, I just screwed that whole thing up, because it has nothing to do with the day, or the month, or the time, it's the man. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He is our rest. And we can't have rest apart from Jesus Christ. There won't be any true meaning in life without Jesus Christ, apart from Jesus Christ. There's no rest. 
And so Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. And he will not, in the same way Boaz will not let this rest, he will not let this just sweep it under the rug, he will accomplish what's been started, just like Jesus Christ. Though the law come and condemn you, and say, I'm closer to God than you all ever be. The law comes in and says, you're not perfect, you're unworthy, you could never stand before an almighty, righteous God. Yet, our kinsman redeemer, Boaz, our greater than Boaz, I should say, Jesus Christ, it brings us in, into his presence, into his love, into his family. And we praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So sit at his feet. Learn of Jesus. And one day, soon, yes, very soon, we can see Jesus face to face. All of the mysteries will be removed. All of those worries and doubts and fears will be laid aside. And what we, were at, what we were created to do from the time we were born, we will finally be in His presence. And you don't want to go before Him clothed in your own righteousness. It'll be disgusting <laughs> in His sight. Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61, I believe it's... Well, let me get there. Isaiah 61. Yeah, 61 verse 3. Sorry about that long pause, but I'm going to finish with this. Isaiah 61 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. In other words, the Lord gives you garments of praise, even though you have a spirit of of depression a spirit of sorrow heaviness that's what that implies he gives you garments of praise sometimes you walk into a Sunday morning service and we're lifting hands singing and praising and we're jumping up and down and we're rolling on the pews and we're doing all that all that stuff and you're in just kind of moping why? Because all week the news has been on. All week co-workers have been chatting away. All week you've had this, that, or the other. It's one of the reasons we have Thursday night. Praise God. Because yeah. <laughs> all week we're getting depressed. We're getting just bogged down with what, what everyone else. It's reality. That's what it is. It's reality. And he gives me, he gives you garments of praise. The world looks and they just go, I don't get it. I don't want to get it. <laughs> but we have these goofy Christian smiles on our faces. All the, me, in the meantime, the world is on fire. Our house is on fire. Everyone around us is just completely dying. They're failing. Everything is just going by the wayside. We're just, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's what the, that whole idea of garments of praise. Even though we're in the midst of such a dying, corrupt, and depressing world. Imagine it without Christ. I mean, at least we have, well, not even at least, it's just, we have Christ. 
do you understand? And I've said this many times before, but I'll say it again. I like being a broken record, by the way. <laughs> this will be, this is the worst will, it will ever be for you, for me. This right now is the worst it will ever be. For them who know not Christ, who don't believe and trust in the Word of God, who don't take of His body and drink of His blood, those who refuse to do so, this is the best it will ever be. Right now, today, is the best it will ever be. Incredible. Really stop and think about that, and it will make you really want to get out there and share as much as you can with those around who don't know, who are lost, or maybe they're just confused because there's so much out there, so many books, so many quote-unquote professors, so many uh, confusions. That's what, by the way, that's what the devil is. Satan is the author of confusion. And one thing I hope that I do is remove confusion. That's what this book does, by the way. That's what, just simply opening it up and reading it like we do and just going through it, it will simplify, not only simplify things, but you in your life. You're no longer going to have all these excuses, all these things that you point to. Those are confusing. But I don't see what the big deal is with you fill in the blank. Abortion. Gay marriage, rights, the, the human rights. Notice too, Ruth had every right to go into Boaz, to go into the threshing floor there and, and have Leviticus 19 in her hand and say, look, by law, you have an obligation here to hold up to. She could have gone in there like that, but instead, and that would be like many today in 2024, demanding rights, marching through the faith. Listen to me, my voice will be heard. No, what does she do? She lays at his feet as a servant and accomplishes what no one can accomplish in, their, in the power of their flesh. Amazing, amazing. But I love it. There's so much there, isn't there? So much. And it's a walk of grace. It's a walk in the Spirit. It's only by God's grace. He gives us joy. I love that. Isaiah 61.3 again. The oil of joy for mourning. The garments of praise. Beauty for ashes. I mean, that's incredible. God's the only one who has ever taken the tomb and turned it into a womb. Really? He's done that. That's what the church is, by the way. Because of the tomb, Jesus Christ was laid in that tomb. He's not there today, I hope you know. He's risen. It's given birth. It became a womb to give birth to what? The church. What you and I celebrate. It's all about that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. And we, well, we celebrate it. Not just Sundays, but every day, I hope. And Father, we thank you for your word. How powerful it is to know that we will see you face to face. But Lord, I pray we would enjoy sitting at your feet, learning of you, worshiping you, just adoring you. Lord, may we come closer to that knowledge of you. Lord, we would not be distracted, we would not be confused you would remove those blinders, those things that separate us from you, and even people so often that can separate us from you. Help us to keep our eyes on you and off of people. Lord, it's so often the downfall, how we, how we slip into these 